such a privilege to um, to have an opportunity to present for the RAS here tonight, especially um, uh, especially when I'm talking about um, a topic which includes several surprising connections to the uh, this very society, uh, as we will see later in this. Um, as we, um, as, as we will see later in this lecture, so um, I'm very uh, pleased to be here. So, um, of course, uh, I really love this picture, don't you think? It's kind of cute picture. <laughs> so, um, so the, t uh, the title of this lecture is just um, pretty self-explanatory, as you can see. Um, I'll be talking about... Um, the earliest recordings of commercial Korean music uh, made in 1906 by Columbia and Victor Company, uh, arguably the biggest uh, uh, recording giants of the uh, of the world at the first half of the 20th century. But before we talk, we start talking about the these actual recordings. I'm going to also talk about the um, some of the history of the sound recording in general, as well as the introduction of the sound recording technology to the. Uh, um, to Korea uh, in the uh, in the 1890s and onward um, to give you an idea uh, of why it's so significant about uh, to have such a like uh, to have this recording here. <coughs> so, so, so in the beginning, Thomas A. Edison invented the phonograph in 1877, but um, as uh, when it was first invented in 1877, it was such a very crude, it was a very crude machine. It was, it made sound recordings on a, by indenting, uh, like in, in making indentations on top of a on, on top of a piece of tin foil, which you glue on a rotating mandrel, and obviously you hand crank it, so it makes the sound very tinny and wobbly and largely unintelligible and it could not play uh, multiple times. You, once you play it once, <laughs> yeah, it happens. <laughs> um, yeah, once it, uh, once it uh, was played back once or twice and it was completely over, you couldn't, you couldn't play it back. It was not like lasting, long, I mean long enough. So Edison saw no future to it and put it aside and went out to Invent like I mean light bulbs as we know it, but after about ten years, when uh, a, a bunch of people, a bunch of scientists and um, mechanics and machinists, tried to improve his favorite baby, as he later called it, um, he decided to make it commercially available again. And uh, he, after much uh, improvements, he finally came up with the machine over you see over here on and on the left here. The, uh, the phonograph. So these uh, these machines used um, phonograph cylinders. They were like they were first made in wax, and later it was uh, later made in celluloid. So it was recorded vertically, and, and what well, Hill and Dale method. So uh, and it could do both recording and sound uh, and playback as well at the same time by just simply switching these heads in front of it, and which I'm going to demonstrate later in our lecture. So um, I'm going to before that, but I'm going to play a little bit of a snippet of how it actually should sound like. So I'm going to do a little bit of a demonstration first and move on. Bad. 
so. Anyway, so this was basically how people, I mean, listened to sound, uh, like sound recordings in the early 1890s and onward. Uh, but while Edison was minding his light bulb business and like um, um, didn't do much of anything in the 1880s to improve this uh, technology, many, as I said, many early other scientists, including Alexander Graham Bell and um, a bunch of others. Uh, tr tried to improve the sound recording te technology to a more advanced and more durable way. So uh, in 1886, there was this German like uh, immigrant mechanic living in Washington, D.C. by the name of Emil Berliner. And he improved, uh, after m m much consideration, he decided uh, the best way to, do, to mass produce sound recordings and preserve it was to flatten out the cylinder. In other words, you make you make a recording on a rotating disc. So he called this technology the gramophone in 1870, 1887, 10 years after the, um, uh, after the initial invention of the phonograph. So it used a flat disc, as we all see, and it was also laterally recorded. So the cylinders went this way, vertically, but it was uh, a disc actually were recorded sideways here. So it's definitely, it was not, of course, uh, interchangeable, but um, anyway, so, but it could be, you know, like, it could be mass-produced as, you know, as, as they called it, it was like waffle iron. It happened again. <laughs> but again, uh, but not only it is significant in many ways, uh, it could be mass-produced and cheaper and louder and could record more longer, like, music on it. Uh, it could, it basically served as a, like, um, precursor to modern, any kind of, like, modern format that uses, like, uh, round, flat disc like starting with modern vinyls, I mean LPs I mean, and uh, DVDs and CDs and Blu-rays, all of them, all of which have basically the same principle. So to give you an idea how it actually improved over like uh, 20 odd years, this is like the, uh, the like, typical example of a gramophone from the 1930s, which I'm gonna play again. different uh, types of um, technology as we had it. The, the big problem, of the, uh, but disadvantage of the gramophone technology was that you, it was only capable of pre playing pre-recorded discs. So you could not record on it like uh, the cylinders could do, you can do on cylinders as we will see later in our demonstration. But um, so naturally, um, the gramophone and this system but eventually took over because the recordings, as I said, could be cheaply mass-produced and uh, from the very beginning. So um, that's basically why we don't make any distinctions between phono the word phonograph and gramophone, at least in the US, U.S. English, because Edison's phonograph simply died out and it was futile just to make any dis I mean, meaningful distinctions between the two. So, um, but um, because of the, these, uh, a series of international patent rights only three companies, I repeat, three companies, the Gramophone Company, later uh, Gramophone Typewriter Company, which later became EMI, uh, in London, England, and its American affiliate, the Victor Talking Machine Company of uh, Camden, New Jersey, and the Columbia Graphophone Company, which was their bitter rival. Like, they really fight over like cats and dogs for the first half of the 20th century. That's always what they did. You can, make a, you can write a book about it. <laughs> but anyway, um, these three companies, only three companies, had exclusive worldwide legal rights to make to produce disc recordings until the light, uh, late teens, late 1900s, 19 teens, until the Berliners patent initially got expired. 
But anyway, bef before 1912, like when it was finally expired, everything about every these three companies were the only companies who could legally uh, produce these discs. So, uh, which created obviously uh, created a huge worldwide monopoly. So, so, so in, as I said, I just described the uh, phonograph and the uh, and phonograph and the gramophone technology, but. Um, so when it comes to like Korean situation, guess what? I, which one came first in this country? Anyone? Gramophone, gramophone or phonograph? It was obviously, actually, uh, phone, uh, the, uh, the phonograph which came into this country for the first time. There has been quite a lot of um, like uh, speculations and like legend, urban legends, and everything about about who introduced it first to the to this country. And there has been so many like variants about it, so you can even you know um, follow the whole thing. But I actually uh, made my like, I myself actually made a recent discovery uh, from the paper collections of the Thomas A. S. and National Historic Site in Orange, New Jersey, where they have tons of like literally thousands and, mil and literally millions of papers, like paper trail uh, of the Edison Corporation when he was uh, when Thomas Edison was alive. Um, he um, like and I discovered a series of um, articles and uh, like documents and letters and receipts and so forth that reveals the very first very first instance wherein the sound recording technology came first came to Korea. So um, in February 1890, this was like about a year or so after the uh, the first uh, commercially available phonograph was put on the market. Everett Fraser. American merchant and who also uh, served as a consul general for Korea in New York, uh, he uh, he was into like elect I mean selling electric electric appliances and wires and so forth. He was also responsible for having the very first electric light bulbs in Korea in Gyeongbokgung in 1887. He arranged a deal with Thomas Edison and to make special presentation photographs for uh, and donate them to the uh, eminent people of the Orient, which included. Uh, Emperor Meiji of Japan and General Ri Hongjiang of China and the King of Korea, uh, i.e. Kojong. So, pro, for promotional purposes, the the idea, of course, is that they uh, he wanted to buy, you know have their hearts on this new invention so that they can endorse it and um, to uh, that will be available to, uh, make it available to sell to the uh, to these countries. So Fraser then met Horace Allen. <laughs> Everybody, would, uh, every, most of you who attended this uh, uh, lecture would know who he was, and he was, of course, uh, like was also involved in RAS early on. Um, who was visiting the U.S. for his missionary affairs? Uh, he uh, Fraser called him to his office and taught him how to operate the phonograph. And Fraser made Allen to present the machine to the king, Kojong, which he did in June or July of 1890. We have this like all these letters coming from it. Uh, however, like what, what, whatever became of this phonograph after after that is not known. Um, there's no Korean sources about this uh, uh, about this uh, donation, and uh, I have a feeling that, like I know about these machines, and these machines were battery driven, and in order to get it running, you have to put um, the battery liquid every 72 hours, which were sulfuric acid. So uh, I have a hunch that this thing wouldn't probably have lasted long. After after initially uh, introduced in this country, but whatever became of it, I have no idea. But the the paper trail unfortunately ends there. But at least um, I can quite pro I quite conclusively prove it, uh, prove that this is the very first in, um, like instance that when the uh, the sound, te sound technology first came to Korea for the first time. So um, to give you an idea, here's the um, here's one of the papers that I discovered, and you can see in here His Majesty. The King of Korea, with compliments of the inventor Thomas A. Edison here. So uh, if this is supposed to be um, the uh, this commemorative plaque that should that would have been in installed in front of the machine. So um, this is one of the very uh, like uh, I'm working on an article which would uh, discuss all these new findings, and will be uh, hopefully can can publish it sometime uh, later this year. Um, however, there are like so we don't know anything about whatever happened to these machines, but um, there's these machines. Um, but as um, like we st we still have a recording, 
we still have a recording of a like of Korean language uh, made in the 1890s. This is the earliest extant Korean recording of any kind, and it was recorded by this individual uh, pioneer anthropologist and ethnomusicologist by the name of Alice Cunningham Fletcher. And he, she was uh, she uh, she specialized uh, she studied the Native American culture and one of the one of the big um, breakthrough that he that she did was to make recordings on uh, like wax cylinders and later transcribe them on um, like note I mean taking notes and transcribing on the uh, modern you know musical notation system. So in on July twenty fourth, eighteen ninety six. Three Korean students who were attending Howard University in Washington, D.C., was brought over uh, Fletcher's um, house, and they were encouraged to make recordings. And it was mostly uh, spoken word and like a little bit of songs and ditties, nursery rhymes, and anything they could think of. So basically, they, uh, it's not clear why she wanted it to uh, wanted to make uh, sound recordings of Korean language. Uh, has been suggested that there it has been uh, some suggestions made by his her friend. Um, Anna Tolman Smith, who was a pedagogist uh, interested in foreign like, foreign students and the like, but anyway, um, the, the fact of the matter is, we still have six cylinders made in this occasion in way back in 120 years ago, and we like as I said, three students are uh, or known to make record made, have made these recordings. We know two of them. We know we we have been uh, we managed to identify two of these people. An Jung-sik and Yi hee Chuk, who are actually uh, sitting, uh, standing in these, in this photograph, two of these people. So um, I don't, we don't really know whatever happened to uh, who is actually who is the third person who actually uh, resided into the cylinder. But um, um, so we do need some like more um, research to be done. These original cylinders were donated after she passed away in 1923. These were. Um, uh, donated to the U.S. Library of Congress and has been sitting there in the shell for about 70 years. And in the process, uh, like in the total neglect and everything, these fragile wax cylinders, two of them were broken. <laughs> so it's uh, it's basic made, making them un basically unplayable. But uh, in the in 1998, Dr. Robert Perlbein, who uh, from University of Maryland, who is hap who happens to be uh, a RAS member as well. He discovered these cylinders recordings for the first time in 1998, and it has been uh, it reissued on a CD and um, like and has been available uh, quite uh, quite a number of times. And there were at least two docu TV documentaries about these uh, these findings. Just to actually see these uh, cylinders in last September when I was doing a project for uh, the Dongdaekgyeongwan, the Independence Hall Museum of Korea, and I just happened to have like this particular. Um, like cylinder in my hand, which was like, yeah, literally, uh, held, I mean, having a holy grail <laughs> in my hand. This is arguably the early, as I said, the um, priceless, priceless artifact from the uh, in terms of sound recording technology. So um, I'm gonna play a little bit of a snippet from this uh, from this cylinder, the very cylinder I'm actually holding. This is a nursery rhyme. Ah, <laughs> 
this is the entire cont content of that particular cylinder that I'm holding. But anyway, there are, uh, yeah, it's not much of a musical performance, if you ask me, but <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, like somebody reciting this, like, um, what this... Year that? Uh, what? what year was that? What year was that? 1896, as I said. So, which makes it, the, as I said, the earliest extant recording of any uh, musical, like, content of a Korean, Korean language. Is there any sound you retrieve from the broken cylinder, or is it completely... Uh, there are, like, eight seconds. So, uh, yeah, it's, it starts with, like, this like doing some rhythm in with clapping by clapping the hands but it cuts off so we don't really and the chunk is missing so if you if you have a chunk like that missing chunk and you could put it together you can actually piece it together right now but because of the neglect of these the entire collection this was literally uh, sitting in a basement for 60 years uh, they didn't do anything to it so uh, a lot of them got not just the Korean ones but all these Native American ones are also like um, deteriorated like uh, significantly but that happens with library, big library collections when they don't really, you know, keep on track. So um, anyway, so so by 1897, many foreigners, including missionaries like William Arthur Noble and Horace Allen, if it's if it is, it's his really, it's really his. I mean, not not the one that, that donated to the Kojong. Like I like I don't know whatever happened to it. But uh, these were uh, these people were known to have either phonographs or gramophones. It's either which or which. Of course, gramophones were uh, cheaper, so many 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 missionaries were actually uh, many uh, actually had gramophones rather than phonographs. The uh, the only people that I uh, the only person that I uh, found who actually had a phonograph was Alan. So <laughs> yeah, he was rich. So. And by eight, but I couldn't find anybody, any any Korean individual who actually owned a machine personally for his personal use at this time. He, you can find some references about these people by around around 1903, 1904. But by 1899, what I could find was that several Koreans, like businessmen, they began to establish what they called yusongi choso or phonograph parlors. It basically is like you have a, uh, one or two phonographs in front of the shop. And you have the spectators, and you know you collect money from your spectators and play these uh, like little bit of snippets of these machine playing music for the first time, and uh, it was such a novelty at the time. And this was not uh, the I mean Korea was not the only place who where they had this kind of places. I mean in the United States they had millions of these things, millions of these places establishments, and Europe and that photograph is from Japan around the same time, 1898 about a year before, but you can still see there's a phonograph here, and you can yeah, you can clearly see some people are listening to it. Eager. Sometimes they use loud horn, like to make it sound, I mean, the sound let, let the sound go through, but some, as you can see, these people are listening to ear tubes, like earpiece, like it's basically like, um, like listening tubes that are connected to the machine, so that, you know, so you, you have to play, you have to pay for it to hear it, Basically, to use that earphone earpiece. So, speak close to the microphone. Yeah. So, <clears throat> not only that, uh, we also have um, um, newspaper clipping. A very interesting use, newspaper article from Dongdeop Shinmun or the Independent uh, from a April twentieth, eighteen ninety nine. And it mentions a banquet by held, hosted by the Ministry of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Webu. And they, uh, when they had a phonograph to play, and later in that banquet, it says uh, when a group uh, they brought over a group of uh, musicians hired for this occasion, and um, they were encouraged to make these uh, sound recordings on, on right on the site, suggesting they were actually using phonographs here, like uh, cylinder phonographs. I'm talking. And so the question is, of course, how I mean, how these machines actually were brought uh, were brought over this country? And the answer is um, from China most of the time in these early years. The word itself, like to describe the machine, yusungi, literally meaning talking machine. This word is, has Chinese origin, and we also have several like newspaper are, uh, like advertisements from Chinese merchants in based in Incheon and Busan and elsewhere. That mentions about phonographs as their um, like as their, as their like um, items of, that they sell in their stores. So um, so and also several newspaper reports 
from the early 1900s and onward. They also uh, mentions about like making like uh, an, an instance of making uh, cylinder recordings of Korean music. And there is also a, uh, a reminiscence of this early 19th, uh, 20th century musician by the name of Park chun who claimed to have made recordings for uh, Kojong's, uh, I mean, for Kojong when in the early 1900s. Now, it has a lot of embellishments, and he, he claims that a lot of things that's simply not true. But um, there are, like, uh, it does reveal that there has been quite a lot of attempt by, attempts by the Koreans to make uh, their uh, make recordings of their own music on this new me uh, new medium, but unfortunately, because these wax cylinders are so fragile, these uh, they are very prone to break. Uh, pro pro very prone to break. They they have a tendency to have mold grew on the surface, uh, destroying the recording. So, so far as I can tell, there has been no surviving examples of these early Korean made recordings from this period. And by 1904 and 1905, people started to, like several trading companies based in Japan, uh, either Japanese-owned trading companies or like had uh, some companies that had uh, connections with the Japanese like uh, dealers, they began to uh, supply gramophones, disc machines, um, as well. And of course, I have a speculation that the reason for it was that to compete against the Chinese merchants at the time who were selling, who were selling uh, phonographs instead of gramophones, so try to like uh, to try to like compete against the uh, with competing for uh, competing uh, technology. But however, the big problem, of course, was that remember, as I said earlier, uh, that these 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 gramophones could only record uh, could only play pre-recorded music. So and it, and obviously lacked software. Like I would say software, of course, the word is <laughs> uh, like recent, but. It obviously lacked the software for Koreans, like commercial disc recordings of Korean music, uh, available at this time. So, um, so they had the it, it, it posed them a lot of interesting, uh, quite a lot of interesting problems for all these record companies. Remember these three companies I I, I mentioned earlier. These companies were eager to have their uh, expand their market to non-European or American uh, com I mean market, but of course they had nothing to offer at this point. So. Uh, as a result, they decided to have what they called recording expeditions. So it's a very grand name, but so in reality, it basically means that they actually sent these recording engineers um, to these remote remote places in Asia, in various parts of Asia and South America, and all these different places to make these recordings of um, of these local talents and ship them ship the masters back to the uh, head office. In, in anywhere, like in Europe or US, and produ I mean, produce them for the commercial use. So the very first occasion w uh, when this happened was in 1902, in September 1902, when Fred Geisberg, Fred, uh, Frederick W. Geisberg, it, may, it sounds German, but he was American. He, is a, he was a second generation uh, German immigrant. Um, so he's a pioneering recording engineer for working for the Gramophone and Typewriter Company. His biggest scoop, he uh, at this time, by 1902, he was already on the road for about two and a half years, and recording all kinds of like uh, celebrity like talents for mostly classical and operatic uh, talents. His biggest scoop was the famous Enrico Caruso, the great operatic tenor. Uh, he is the first very first person who recorded him for the first time. But um, so he was very good. he was he showed you know he he showed premises for like uh, doing this task to this Herculean task. First of all. This recording uh, apparatus of the period, they, it weighed about 120 kilograms and uh, like 260 pounds. And it, because it was weight driven, it, was, uh, it had weight, it had a weight driven motor, it did not have any electricity with it. And plus you had to have thousands of these fragile wax tablets like to make recordings on. So you have like literally, you, he, had, like, he had to go with a ton of like equipment and like machines to go, go with. But he, uh, he proved himself to be quite worthy of this task for two and a half years, so the company decided to send him to all different parts of Asia. So she, starting in September 1902, Geisberg visited Calcutta, India, starting with that, and made all kinds of recordings uh, from India and the Straits, I'm talking about Singapore and Malay, and, um, and went to Japan, China, and Thailand. In the, in in the times between, he also recorded um, some Tibetan music as well. 
So, uh, like, can you imagine? I mean, like, bringing all these heavy equipment all the way to Tibet? That would be like great task. But um, it was he was all by himself. He he only had two other assistants to go with him. They were literally his porters. But <laughs> uh, but anyway. So and of course he had a he had some fun in Japan, as you can see in this photograph. But um, so he managed to make within this about this about a year in between uh, in his time in Asia, he managed to make about 1,700 recordings in 16 different languages, which is a great I mean, like accomplishment, of course. And of course, it res it resulted a huge commercial success for the company. And this commercial sure, success. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Are these on the fragile. Like these are like I mean like so they recorded what they did was like they made. Um, Original recordings on the wax, wax tablet, wax wax plate. They shipped them back to the uh, back to UK, and they electroplated to make a metal part, a metal stamper to press records, and they pressed them. So it was a like a ama I mean like great deal amount of work, and of course it, the safety was always a big concern because these things were very fragile. But um, but anyway, this commercial success of this expedition eventually led these competitors to initiate their own version of recording expeditions include, and around 1903. And of course, uh, though the gramophone and typewriter company managed to have a lead on this uh, expeditions, there are many other comp competitors. Like, and, um, however, the problem, of course, was <clears throat> that Geisberg, obviously, or anybody who was in, involved in this recording uh, record making at the time, they were all Americans, they were young, they had no like uh, special training whatsoever to understand the music or anything. So they lacked absolutely no under I mean, they had no understanding of the non-European recording, I mean like music or like anything, language, so forth. And they occasionally made quite a lot of like racist remarks. And uh, this is a passage from Geisberg's own diary from 1903 when he was visiting Japan. He said, Japanese music is simply too horrible but funny to relate. To me, it sounded like a donkey brain, so that's how he felt about it. This obviously, of course, meant that you know, if you have no understanding of the music, obviously you cannot find any talent to make to make it, like to make a suitable record. I mean, commercially available, a commercially viable a product. So this always meant that the recording engineers had must uh, had to um, like contact an intermediary. Uh, between them and between them and the uh, the locals or either consumers or the uh, talents itself, these intermediaries, of course, also acted as a talent scout. Both acted as a talent scout as well as um, as well as a sales agent at the time. So we don't have that much of a, like um, information about these intermediaries. We do have some of them, like some of these people, do have their names on their like diaries and journals, but. Uh, we don't really know much about them except this one individual here, this case of Japan. So here's this really fascinating individual by the name of Henley Black. He was a, he was born in Australia, uh, um, and his uh, he was he came to Japan at the age of six when um, when his father uh, was appointed as an editor for this English newspaper in Yokohama. So he was he came to Japan in the early Meiji period. And he picked up, obviously picked up in, uh, Japanese, like, like, I mean, he became fluent, I mean, like, he became a native to it. And he worked with this newspaper, and he also worked as an English instructor, like everybody does. Um, but uh, by 1890s, his, uh, his, uh, he was no longer needed for his service, so in the end, what he did was he became a kabuki actor. <laughs> so, which is a really inter interesting <laughs> way, I mean, career way, career path. Uh, he also, yeah, he also acted as a professional rakugo teller. I mean, rakugo, of course, is the uh, tr uh, Japanese traditional storytelling. He made a fortune by introducing new, like, um, new repertoires, like the his adaptation of Oliver Twist in Japanese fashion. So um, he made a he made an instant hit, and so he used the stage name of Kai, uh, Kairakute Braku. Uh, uh, Braku obviously means black. But um, but anyway, he also became sort of like an entrepreneur for many of these talents working in Tokyo and Osaka region, and that is why that uh, Geisberg contacted him in advance to make him to help him out to have this talent um, talent needed for this recording business. So Geisberg, in his in his um, later autobiography, 
He said, uh, Mr. Black was an Englishman married to a Japanese lady, and blah, blah, blah. Naturally, as he spoke both English and Japanese with equal fluency, he was a godsend to us. So he was like, um, yeah, so he, he, played, he appeared, obviously played a very pivotal role in this uh, record making. And the Japanese records were among the highest sellers of the gramophone offerings, uh, gramophone Asian recording offerings at the time. So he also, of course, made arrangements to sell the uh, gramophones and its disc for uh, many places, many establishments, many general stores that he uh, frequented um, via several trading companies in Tokyo and Osaka. And there's a, there has been quite a lot of interesting, um, like, I mean, since he is so interesting, he, like, there has been quite a lot of um, books and, like, even PhD, like, dissertations about this individual uh, coming from, I think, University of Adelaide in, uh, in <coughs> Australia. So I, I strongly encourage you to check it out. It's all online, available online. Was the gramophone expensive? So uh, yeah, it was, but uh, it, it was very. It was still a luxury item at this point, but later on, of course, it being slightly cheaper, and it was still cheaper than these uh, phonographs because the problem with these phonographs is that these were made like tanks. You have all these gearings and machine. I mean, like all these machinery going on. It has like this model alone. You see on top of here, it has forty-seven patents go go with it. So like you can imagine how difficult it was to make, uh, to produce it at the time. But, so, so Columbia, after all these uh, big um, success achieved by the Gramophone company at the time, uh, Columbia decided to enter the Japanese, uh, Asian market. In, in China, like, um, in China and Japan in November 1903. So, in, but instead of making, like, um, recording expedition first on, early on, they decided to pl have this, their, uh, production plant, pr uh, production facility for gramophones first. Um, so they had the production facility established in Japan, and um, and began to make uh, began to make the localized versions, cheaper ver versions of these uh, machines to sell to the uh, general public. Of course, the uh, since they use the same like um, same technology, of course, it was also quite compatible to play the gramophone disc on it. So um, naturally, that's that was their way to go. So. To counter this heavy, uh, like heavy, like attempt from Colombia, their bitter rival, like the gramophone company, decided to have uh, this this division of the Asian market with his American affi affiliate, the Victor Talking Machine Company, because they didn't want to have any kind of like any kind of like unwanted um, competition to uh, to sell their products in between. So uh, in this initial negotiation, Victor would have. Sales rights for China, Indonesia, Indochina, and the Philippines, and whereas the whereas the gramophone company would have India and Japan. So, in Korea at this time was still relatively an untapped market, so they had no negotiations about it at the time. But uh, so, but eventually, the Korea was uh, thought to be a viable market in the end. So in early 1904, finally Columbia decided to Columbia decided to have two recording engineers by the name of Charles Carson and Harry Marker. Um, so these uh, these people were brought over to uh, initially from chi to China first, and they went back and forth between Shanghai and Osaka, and they just made about like thousands of recordings between these countries. So he so. They were dispatched to these regions, and um, as for the China, uh, we don't have many, any like surviving documentations about their activities because, unlike Victor, we, we, they, where they still have the enormous amount of paper trail, um, Colombia went bankrupt er, first in the early 1930s, and they destroyed the entire files. Mm -hmm. So, which means that we don't really have that much of like information about their activities before the 1930s, but. Um, sometime between, like, uh, thanks to the, uh, like, this, this is, we can, we know about this because um, Harry Marker in his later years actually gave a lot of interviews for some of, uh, several researchers who were, who were interested in, like, early, history of early sound recordings. And um, so, some, and according to him, and there are a couple of other Japanese sources and advertisements and newspaper, like, clippings and so forth, and we know, because of that, we know that sometime between November 1905 and February 1906, they, uh, these two, these, these duo were like, were in Osaka and they were making 
about 1,000 recordings of Japanese music. And uh, when they were doing it, uh, they, we don't know how it was actually done, but somehow somebody brought over two Korean singers uh, by the name of Han, one was by the name of Han Inho, Han In Oh, who was uh, was a specialist in Gyeonggi region, Gyeonggi folk song kind of an artist, and Choi Hong Mei was a key singer. So these two, and we, and these people were accompanied by three, at least three uh, instrumentalists. So we have five different uh, Korean uh, musicians brought over to Osaka. We don't really, we still don't know we, who actually made this arrangement, but anyway, they actually made it. So they made, eventually made 30 uh, size of Korean folk songs, making their recordings to be the very first commercial recordings of Korean music ever recorded. But these recordings were never put on, not put to sale until uh, uh, about a year, a full year later, in March of 1903. And by this time, Victor, as we'll see later, had already uh, issued their uh, offerings already. So. They uh, it came now it's sort of like a second like recording to be re uh, released. So, so among these thirty titles of recordings that they produced, we have about ten of them still uh, still reported. All in each unique. All of these all of these things are unique copies. These there are no other second copies of these things, and. Like my the archive I represent, the Korean 78 RPM discographical archive that I uh, we have this website in the database. I strongly encourage you to go into go go Google it. But we have we we you know in our archive we have eight of them, and the other two, these two on the side on each side, these surfaced as a photographs, like it appeared on auction websites, and it was definitely sold to someone, but we don't know who who got it. So like these are the only. Like uh, remnants of it, and it has been never like surfaced ever since. So we have eight recordings of them, but uh, all of these eight recordings were put on a CD on their centennial in in 2007. So um, you can actually uh, get these CDs in like uh, in online shops and so forth. So let's hear one snippet from the uh, from the record uh, from one of these recordings here. So here's the uh, one over there. That's. Yusanga, another very popular folk song of the period. see this really dismal in sound quality because what the problem with Columbia recordings of the period was that um, like they I mean this com this company totally lacked any like uh, like uh, their recording uh, equipment was incapable of making a decent human voice recording they were very uh, they were very um, like um, targeted I, I mean their recording machines were like initially were recording for the instrumental music and they were like, I mean, it was such a dismal failure that like, don't, I mean, not just the, uh, this one, but basically every Columbia recordings made at this time, like US and European recordings and the like, they, are all, they all sound terribly dismal like this. But don't get up from your seats because we are going to listen to some very decent ones later on in our lecture. <laughs> so, so, going back to 1904, Shan, as Columbia, Columbia's activities uh, definitely put some threat in the Orient when, in terms in their eyes of the uh, gramophone and typewriter company. Uh, they decided they finally decided to have a second major ex recording expedition to counter with their activities. Uh, but their, the problem was uh, so Victor sends George C. Cheney um, to China in late in late 1904, making 
about a thousand recordings up to 1905. But GMT also decided to dispatch their own uh, recording engineer to the Orient. The, pro the, pro but the problem was, excuse me, uh, the problem was that these uh, GMT had a massive sales, like in both in Russia and Japan at the time, and of course Japan and Russia were having a war. So, and but they still wanted to like make some profits out of it, as you can see in this hilarious um, like uh, advertisements. Now that hostilities have been openly commerced between Russia and Japan, we feel sure that it will be interesting to all gramophone users to hear their own homes of their national anthem, war songs, and other patriotic music of the two countries in question. So we are issuing today the undermentioned records, and we may add that these records were actually made in Russia and in Japan, yes they were, by native performers. These and quote unquote, and these records therefore represent with absolute truth that the national characteristics of these patriotic music of those two nations, which are who are now opposing each other in the Far East. So they were made, trying to make some good profits in, in all parts of the other country, all parts of the world, except these two countries. So they sold Japanese and Russian music at the same time. So, but they were so anyway. So they tried to have some like slow approach to it. So, at, and so by 1905, um, when the uh, when the conflict was almost over, Victor Pre uh, Victor all of a sudden had second thoughts about Japan's Japan's victory victory like it's kind of like mis a misnomer really, but uh, Japan's victory over Russia in this war starting in about 1905. So. So finally, in April 1906, GNT decided to dispatch William Conrad Geisberg, the younger brother of Fred, to vote the second, yeah, so the entire company worked for this company, by the way. So, uh, the Fred for the second major recording expedition in Asia. So, so Will Geisberg began to make recordings in Calcutta in May of 1906, and goes, basically follows his brother's route. And so he basically goes to Delhi, Madras, Bombay, and Rangoon in, in Burma for the first time, and departs for Japan from Rangoon in late October. Meanwhile, um, Victor President Eldris Reeves Johnson, uh, the man over there, like on the right, uh, ordered his staff to have to get various statistics from, let's say, World Almanac and so forth, all kinds of different sources at the time available at the time to uh, to get information about Japan. And he decided to call GNT to the renegotiating table. So the reason, and the reason for it, obviously, was that Japan now seems to be very viable in their like in their commercial value for these uh, eyes of the uh, U.S. like manufacturers. And um, so here we have. Um, excuse me. So he so at the time there were like the Japanese demand for a gramophone skyrocketed during this during this period and here's the, and here's this interesting passage from like uh, basically it says uh, from it's coming from this top this trade journal they had yeah the gramophone industry had their trade journal by the name of Talking Machine Review and there's this big coverage about the Russian Japanese war and the Japanese customers and they basically say that. The Japanese are the best customers of the world, as they were always eager to buy any machines or records without questioning, and never complained about what they got. So, <laughs> so basically, so they, they could you know get quite a lot of fortune selling these selling these things, no matter what. So, and of course, like if you go to this uh, little bit of a history lesson here, in 1900, the total value of U.S export goods to Japan, according to the statistic coming from the U.S. Department of Commerce, was $19 million, which was quite significant already. But by 1905, within five years, the total had almost tripled to $52 million, which was almost twice as larger than Argentina, the entire like exports to Argentina that U.S. had at the time, and almost as equal as China, which was like $56 million at the time. And Korea also, on the other hand, became sort of like a rel relatively um, ba I mean, noticeable and valuable market to the eyes of the U.S. Uh, manufacturers. So in 1900, it was only they were having revenues from of uh, 387 thousand dollars in 1900, but within five years, it it 
became it also went up to like about one hundred one million dollars, almost a slightly larger than Thailand. So obviously they dis they finally decide decided that uh, like Japan Japanese market is too bo too too good to have you know to let the GNT have their fun basically. <laughs> So Victor expresses their wishes to um, have Japan to their market share, and in the exchange of their uh, shares on the Indochina and the Pacific Islands, yes, they actually sold records to Tahiti and Micronesian nations at the at, at this early in 1900s. So, and of course, pictures here are of course uh, from contemporary uh, like uh, cartoons, political cartoons, and of course, uncle, uh, yeah. So, like Uncle Sam obviously <laughs> is fond of Japan. And I love the third one here. It says, um, can you read what it says? It says, um, yeah, I want you, uh, so Uncle Sam to Japan, I want you to understand that I'm supposed to stay neutral. So <laughs> basically, yeah, but they are still giving quite a lot of funds to it. Of course, we, that, we know that. Um, anyway, so because of all these negotiations, so uh, by the time like Will Geisberg began to make recordings in, in Japan for the gramophone company initially, um, GNT actually accepted this this exchange, and um, Korea at the time was considered to be the Jap part of the Japanese market because it, keep in mind that this was almost a year exactly a year after the, the USA, I mean the signing of the USA Treaty. So obviously they figured that the Korea was in part the Japanese market. So they decided to uh, give Korea to Japan as uh, to Victor as well. So at the time, also the Talking Machine Com uh, Review, that trade journal, it also mentions about this agreement. It says Korea has a significance which which is somewhat more than political. It must be considered as bearing on the commercial uh, commercial um, de uh, de development of Japan. Korea, only a, a ferry service of nine hours away. We'll be able to supply the growing demands for food products and raw material uh, in Japan and keep the profits in Japanese hands. So they actually explain the whole result, uh, whole reason for this exchange. So, and of course, Will Geisberg eventually arrived in Seoul, and around the third and fourth week of November 1906, and begins begins to make recordings of Korean music. And of course, he always needed. He always obviously needed an intermediary, and that intermediary happened to be Omar Herbert, the uh, also uh, one of the founding members of the uh, this very uh, society that I'm presenting here. So Will Geisberg called Homer B. Herbert to help him out, found finding Korean musicians and other talents, and worthy of recording. And Herbert initially accepts the offer. Uh, uh, we don't have any surviving paper trails in the Victor archives, but um, we also we actually have this letter that he sent to his parents in December 1906, and this is like uh, this is this letter. It says, "What do you say? What do you think I've gotten? An agent from the Victor Gramophone came here to make recording, make records of all kinds of Korean music. That's hence the name of the, this lecture. I helped him out find." The singers and players. He made over 100 records, and blah blah blah. He gave me a beautiful straw violin, and you might ask, what is straw violin? So this is the straw violin in here. Uh, I couldn't really find any big picture of this thing. So basically, this is a violin with a horn and a diaphragm attached to it, so that it, you know, it's very directional. So you to make a recording of a violin in early technology, you could actually, yeah, the, because the nat ordinary violin was simply too soft to, to, record it, to be recorded properly, so they created this device with, 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 um, with diaphragms and uh, horn attached to it so that it could be directional and louder. So, and, they, and he also says they, want, they, they, they may want me to handle the gramophone out here through my Korean company. If so, it will pay big stuff. So, yeah, yeah, quite frank about it, yeah, so I tried to find about like this particular company, of course, he was working, at the time he was working, he had like <coughs> business collaborations with Colburn and Bostwick, the uh, head of the uh, so, um, like electric company at the time. Uh, for those who don't believe, like actually when I, uh, like this is not the first time this um, letter had surfaced, there was one, one Japanese researcher, Yamauchi Fumitaka, who discovered this letter first at the time in 2007, but 
he made little bit of a, like um, minor mistakes in, in transcribing the work because his handwriting isn't particularly good. But here is the letter. So um, yeah, for those who want who want to do to try try by themselves, I can you know, I can actually send this image to you. Anyway, so this is how the recordings were made. I couldn't really find any contemporary photographs. This is from the 1940s, sort of like a retrospect recreation of it, because at the time, like before, in the, when these things were in use, these were all trade secrets, so they never took pictures <coughs> of them. But now, in the 1940s, there was no need for it, so there's this attempt. So it's driven by this big chunk of weight, and there's this thick wax tablet and there's a diaphragm to it, and you shout into this horn, and the diaphragm vibrates, and it's connected with a, with a needle to it, and the needle vibrates, creates this groove, and it's basically, you know, creates this impression of sound to it. And I'm gonna, of course, we are like, just wait for it, but we are going to demonstrate it uh, later on. So, Will Geisberg made, eventually made 36 7-inch sides, so when it first started, um, when, when gramophone was first invented, the standard size was 10, 7 inch. But in the early 1900s, they decided to expand that slightly longer, so it made 10 inch records. And of course, eventually, they, uh, they couldn't really decide to what to became of the next larger format, so they experimented with 16 inch, 14 inch, and, but eventually they, uh, they ended up using 12 inch. So that's the standard LP size today. But uh, 65 LP, uh, 65 10 inch size, and uh, at the time 12 inch was still a very large and expensive um, like uh, format, so they didn't record Korean music on it. In fact, to, throughout the entire like 70 R, uh, the lifespan of the 70 RPM records in Korea, there was only one 12 inch record to, to be made. It's actually radio exercise music, so <laughs> it's kind of boring. But um, he completes his recording task in Seoul on December 3rd in 1906. We know this because he sent a telegram to head office in London, and we have this telegram. So that's we have it absolutely clear. We are absolutely clear that when he com uh, completed his task. After that, since the whole negotiation was over, he was instructed to give uh, these original wax masters all the way to like instead of sending it back to England where he came from. He had he were like he decided he was instructed to send them over to like Victor to Camden, New Jersey, all the way up from Korea. Imagine how long would it take? But um, so he shipped all these hundred and one Korean masters, as well as about five hundred <laughs> wax masters that he recorded in Japan at the time. So they were all shipped back to Camden, New Jersey. This is the Victor recording. This the whole building here, like. These 16 buildings that you see here, these are the entire Victor facility. Camden, New Jersey, the city of Camden, New Jersey, literally, I mean, relied on this thing, this entire like facility. It had 300,000 employees. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, but of course, uh, just a side note, if you go to Camden, New Jersey now, like there's only one building in the corner, everything was completely demolished. They literally dynamited the entire facility in 1967 when they uh, got rid of the, uh, their recording department. And they literally dynamited the whole thing on a single day and literally tossed the debris in the Delaware River. So, yeah, that's how it was done in the 60s. But anyway, these uh, original wax masters were shipped back to um, Camden, New Jersey, and during the transit, five of them, four 7-inch records and one 10-inch record was either broken or became useless. They got bows on it or whatever. So, the, so in the end, eventually, out of 101 discs made at the time, 96 of them were eventually issued. So, and this, at the time, this was all like, uh, at the time, records were all only single-sided. So they only had recordings on the one side, just like a CD. But um, later, of course, later on, of course, they later developed the uh, double-sided records, starting in 1908. So the reason I know about all these informations about why these things were broke, uh, how these things were broken, what it was issued, or whatever, we know this thanks to this piece, this this handwritten like journal, a day-by-day -day journal kept at the factory, um, called they call it recording ledgers. And uh, these are like most of them. I mean, most of these ledgers do survive, and these are all housed in the uh, um, 
Sony Archives, so, uh, Sony Archives in New York, Sony Music Group Archives, because Sony is the legal pre uh, illegal successor to the Victor Talking Machine Company because they bought the assets of it. So uh, this is not the uh, the Korean like recording ledger, but there are like Korean, still some surviving Korean ledgers. There are like this being like literally the size of this um, this screen here. So I couldn't take photographs of it. But um, I had a like number of friends who actually helped me out, a uh, number of researchers who helped me out with it. So he, they transcribed, some of them helped me out, transcribed these um, original recording info uh, ledgers information. And as you can see, you have the catalog number, like the, the, the numbers you see on the label, and the uh, matrix number. The matrix number goes with the, um, the actual metal part, metal like stamper. And uh, as you can see, NR, not released listed as broken, of course this one was broken. And, uh, and so you have first artist, second artist, of course they couldn't read Korean so they didn't put any names on it, which is like, <laughs> which is big blow to my research. But you have something like female fancy drumming, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, but um, you see Kayagum and all kinds of band, drum, and like, all kinds of interesting stuff. So we can anyway. We still can by comparing these recording. I mean, information on the recording, surviving recording ledger, and um, them, some surviving discs. We can actually reconstruct to a certain degree of how, uh, what kind of repertoire and music were recorded by uh, Victor at the time. Of course, you don't really need to do that guesswork if you have the original catalog. This own, the, the only known co uh, copy of this Korean Victor record catalog was owned by this Japanese um, individual collector by the name of Yamaguchi Kamenosuke in the 1930s. And just for a teaser, he, um, he actually uh, included it in his book. He, did, he wrote this hist a little brief history of the record, uh, history of recording and sort of like a collector's guide and so forth. He, in, in that book from 1936, there's this like two photocopies of this um, catalog that he owned. That's what he included here. However, this copy, along with all of his collection, all of his record collection, were completely destroyed during the air raid in Tokyo. So we don't have it. However, I messed, I recently, just like about like three months ago actually, had discovered a near complete listing of at least all 64 10 inch side, uh, 10 inch issued sides like the entire catalog of it in a private collection and I'm working on it, I'm not disclosing any of it today <laughs> I'm still, because I'm still working on a journal but a journal article uh, is, I'm, re I'm writing a journal article right now about this new discovery as well as a couple of other findings since I did, uh, that I did since I wrote an article about this like 1906 recordings back in 2015 so um, but yeah but these Korean Victor records were shipped to Korea in January of 1907, and these were handled by the Jonophone company. Jonophone was actually a separate company, but Victor bought it out to, to eliminate the competition and repurposed it as sort of like a budget label, so it was like cheaper records. So uh, Victor, Victor's budget subsidiary anyway, so, um, which also dealt with sales of Chinese records. So they were a bit cautious when they were trying to sell these records to, uh, to, for the first time to this untapped market. But, so, a rep and there has been a reference to these records that appears on several Korean newspaper articles in around 1907, March of 1907. Harvard, however, who were so eager to sell these things, <laughs> was liquidating his properties in, starting in uh, February 1907 because, as we all know, uh, Kojong gave him a secret mission to support the, his, uh, the king's um, secret emissaries to The Hague. So by May 1907, Hobart, was le uh, Hobart left the country for good. He, he visited the country twice after that, but um, before eventually coming, like, coming for the final visit in 1949, which killed, it, killed him. But, um, but anyway, so he was, a he, was a, you know, he was gone for good by 19 uh, late 1907. So eventually, a Japanese company, a trading company by the name of Ori Trading Company, or Chikko Sangwe in Korean, is a Japanese-owned company, in Seoul, took over the distribution of these records up to 1912. And initially, these com this company was actually a subsidiary of a, of a 
kind of, a, of a, another bigger trading company by the name of a Sale and Fraser. Remember Fraser? So this is initially the very company that was um, established by our good our old friend Everett Fraser, who introduced this very technology to Korea for the first time. So it's kind of interesting coincidence here. So, but partial evidence suggests that less than 1,200 copies, a very tiny number of records, of copies of Victor Korean records, I mean, all 100 titles combined were sold to Korea up to 1910. We know this because we have some partial statistics coming from the Victor archives as well as the Department of Commerce. They say they got the gross revenue of seven, uh, $720. It's, and assuming they, uh, they were sold for six, I mean, 60 cents each, it means it translates to about 1,200 copies. So this was 60 cents each. But of course, 60 cents back then, it's, it's nothing to us, but at the time it was still relatively large sum of money. And in Korea at the time, it was like uh, roughly the equivalent of uh, three and a half won, which was almost as equal of the annual school fee, school tuition. So this was a big money for just a single, one single-sided record. So if you want to have 10 selections, then you will have 35 won which is, I mean, your annual income almost. So this was very expensive. And not only that... Okay. So, and the Nippon Open Company, the first very true gramophone and record manufacturer established in Japan, they began to sell in cheaper price of Korean selections in 1911. And the Junophone Company got entangled with some legal trouble, so they have to uh, force they, they forced to like uh, liquidate their assets in 1912, and of course that obviously in, in, uh, uh, it resulted the discontinuation, discontinuing of the Korean products in 1912. So still, nevertheless, even though there were like dismal commercial failures, they were like um, quite historically and culturally significant in many ways. The first, obviously, this was very first commercial record, sound recording ever recorded in Korea and features over diff 50 different uh, individual musicians, and features a variety of regional music over 10 different places, including Seoul, Gyeonggi, uh, Seoul, Kimhae, Icheon, Cheongju, and um, Pyongyang, and all these other different places. So, and it also provides a very unique and fascinating glimpse into the musical environment and taste of the last, late Joseon era. So, and you might ask, when you think about the traditional music as we know it. I mean, we instantly think about Pansori for, I mean, like, first. But in, if you go through the entire selections provided them, provided by the company, there are only three Pansori selections there. And a lot of them are like folk songs and Sijo singing, folk instrumental ensembles, which don't, you don't hear anymore, and royal procession music, festival music, etc. And a lot of the, these music got, literally got extinct. Like, it's no longer to be performed. It, it has no, like, written, re uh, written resources about them, uh, making these recordings to be only um, um, extant record, I mean, like, recordings of these types of music. So finally, we now have some samples here. And you'll be surprised how, uh, how nice several of, these, uh, several of these recordings sound like. So uh, first of all, we have Yoksa Taeyong. Dechita, Imperial Dechita, which is probably the only authentic recording of a royal procession music played by the royal musicians. <clears throat> it's very loud, actually.
Absolute favorite of nine, which is dog fight invitation. Okay. You can play it. Okay. You have blessing. Okay. Yeah, but we can actually play. Yeah, okay. Then the, the earliest punter recording in existence. And this is from the University of Hawaii collection, and it's in very rough shape, but I managed to make it very, uh, managed to restore the sound. <laughs> Singer made several recordings, hundreds of recordings up to the 1930s, but this is arguably his earliest recording. And as you can see, there's A here, which indicates there's a two part. This is a two part recording, but it's like the second part is still missing and you're still searching for it. Finally, my absolute favorite, the dog fight imitation. So this is a vocal imitation of a dog fight, and rendered by a vocal artist, which is identified as Koja Degam or Master Yunok. I don't know what that means. We know nothing about this individual. But obviously, there has been quite a lot of early uh, recorded repertoire in rip and open catalogs and everything. So that uh, that features several like similar stuff, like a dog fight, cock fight, all kinds of things, like bird imitations. So, um, so this obviously suggests that these sort of, this sort of like vocal imitation was a very popular like form of entertainment at the time. But I'm only, of course, playing you a snippet, but yeah, it's a blowout, so. <laughs> Three and a half minutes, <laughs> and at the last minute, just before the uh, group ends, there's you, there's a very distinctive chuckle. <laughs> Somebody was laughing out hysterically, but um, like that I didn't include it. Commercial what? Um, release like what? So like that, like that was meant to be a commercial release, oh, yeah. like where it's like, oh, this is gonna sell so many copies. <laughs> you know what? We have found we have found three copies of this. Oh. Yeah, this is like yeah, obviously was a huge seller. But um, yeah, well, whatever. So anyway, so prior to 19, uh, 2014, before I went to the states for the first time, like uh, for my like like uh, exchange student bit. There were only 11 titles, each in unique copies, and my archive, our archive actually owns out, uh, owns, owns five out of 11. But since 2014, when I went to the uh, like, like to study for exchange student for first semester, um, I have located an additional 15 copies of these records. 13 of them are unique, and two of them are duplicates. Uh, in various archives and collections in U and U.S. and elsewhere, and making. The whole total on the surviving Korean Victor titles to be 24, which is about one fourth of it. So we still need to find, I mean, three thirds of it, three fourths of it. But it's you know, it's, it's a good start, I would say. So um, the National Gula Center also, Kumi uh, Kuwa also had a special concert in September 2016 when they performed uh, reconstructions of these royal procession music, the the piece you just heard. 
and captured in Victor Disc uh, discovered by me. So uh, I'm going to play a little bit of that. Uh, it's like 12 minutes long, but um, I'm going to play a little bit of that. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Wait, wait, wait. It's coming. Full screen. It's full screen. So and finally, I have to I have to make this very important announcement before I finish and do this uh, uh, demonstration. Um, a CD reissue of every uh, available uh, Victor recordings from 1906 is is currently being used within this year, presumably in the first half of this year. So um, and this will be, unfortunately, this will be. I'm not. We are not. Um, Reissuing for like uh, for commercial purposes, we are donating these CDs for it's a not for sale thing, but we will be donating these things to institutions, colleges, libraries. RAS. And, and RAS, yeah, yeah, I will do that. So um, anyway, so that's the uh, end of our the, my lecture, and yeah, I thank you for like joining me today. But, but don't, don't get up from your seats because I'm going to do a little bit of a demonstration. It will only take about five minutes, so five. So, as I said earlier, you can make a recording on this machine by. So the thing you do is to change the heads. Change the heads. This is a record user. This is a play the playing it. But there is a separate thing called yeah, this is a recorder. This is a hundred year hundred and ten year old stock. It's inside the box. It's in pristine condition. And no usually these things do not survive at all, but the, this thing somehow managed to do it. So here's the uh, recorder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this thing. And of course, you can record it over a pre-existing cylinder. Cylinder, but this is a blank cylinder, just like blank cassettes. They made blank cylinders back in the day. They're still making them. So that's not 100 years old. Yeah, this is like a new stock from about uh, like three years ago. Uh, but this carton, this box is 100 years old. But um, <laughs> but anyway, so what I'm going to do. Winding this machine to the fullest capacity. It will run for about 20 minutes for a single winding, which is amazing. Just a single little spring inside. But anyway, I'll put this blank. Notice I, how I touch this thing. You cannot touch it because you leave fingerprints on it. This is basically a metallic soap. So you, if you touch them on the surface, you make fingerprints mark all over the place. So, cool. Let's 
switch it to the uh, recorder here. Right. So I asked two of my friends here to to volunteer for this occasion. So, can you come over, please? Jacko? No. Was no, I was... Actually, actually, I've got a friend here, Samia, who's a, an actual singer from New York. Okay. Oh. Okay. In so, the meantime, I would like to chastise the other members of the RAS for when being asked who was the loudest member. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so... What's your name again? Samia. 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 Okay. So yes. I will start with you first, and please, before you before you sing, please uh, recite you know today's uh, like t the date of this you know day, and you know just okay. and name and sing whatever you want. And we have a maximum amount of two minutes, and we have another another person waiting for us. So it, it should be short okay. and loud. And so you, you want me to okay sing so something short and loud. Show them loud. <laughs> All right. And so I will say when I say this. You go like you have to be right in front of here. Like, okay. You literally put your face here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're not close. You really put your whole face. Yeah. He hasn't started it yet. Uh, one. <laughs> when he does, two, I will. Three. It's January twenty third, twenty eighteen. My name is Sammy Amounts. And I am telling you, I'm not going. You're the best man I'll ever know. There's no way I could ever go. Darling, there's no way. No, 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 no way. I'm living without you. I'm not living without you. I don't want to be free. I'm staying. I'm staying. You and you. You're gonna love me. Bonus points if you can name that musical. <laughs> so um, before we do start the second sex action selection, notice how many wax cutting you hear. This is called swerve. You have to. You you probably noticed that why I'm, I was constantly blowing the whole thing because. It is creating quite a mess here. But after I cleaned this thing a little bit. And that was way better than Jack. <laughs> <laughs> we have about a minute. Oh, you never heard these things. Nice to see you. Call it on. This is kind of. I never will. will tell you. <laughs> Just. Second time I do this, um, hopefully this will be better. Um, anyway. Somebody has to be, have some vacuum cleaner here. <laughs> <laughs> 
after this. So I go back. Get her back in place. I definitely need to have, you know, have brought my brush, but unfortunately I forgot about it. But 